Keith Moon was Rock's wildest character in the 60s and 70s, an unapologetic, freewheeling hedonist whose lifestyle became synonymous with the mad, carefree image of the rock star at large. He courted the press and became notorious as Moon the Loon, the incorrigible clown who respected no authority whatsoever and never knew the meaning of the word embarrassment. As The Who became massively popular worldwide, Keith Moon became a celebrity, not just as a drummer, but as the mad jester to Rock's high court, whose exploits included cross-dressing and elaborate practical jokes. Keith Moon was therefore more than just Rock's greatest drummer, he was also its greatest character and wildest party animal. Fueled by vast quantities of drink, drugs, insecurities and confusion, Moon destroyed everything with gleeful abandon. Drum kits, houses, cars, hotels, relationships and finally himself. When Moon was recruited by the fledgling Who in 1964 after passing an audition in a pub, no one would pretend that they knew how the dangerous essential chemistry would develop between four of the most cohesive forces rock music would ever see. It's very rare to come across a record by The Who on which Moon is not a crucial part. He was there through eight albums and around 35 singles, unforgettable to the last beat. One of the reasons The Who surged to prominence in the mid-1960s was because Keith Moon played the drums like a man possessed by a demon. He hit the drums so hard it appeared he was trying to destroy them. After many concerts, he would kick his kit about the stage and sometimes fling it into the audience. The consequences of such recklessness be damned. A decidedly hyperactive kid, Keith Moon grew up in England during the 1950s, a time when such difficult children were considered dysfunctional at best, or worse, brain damaged. These days, such a youngster would probably be labelled as suffering from Attention Deficit Hyperactivity Disorder, or ADHD. In the spring of 1961, when Moon was 14, Moon's friend Jerry Evans was one of the first people ever to hear Moon play the drums. Evans said, He was just hitting everything in sight and making a load of noise. There was no way this guy was going to be a professional drummer. It was impossible because he didn't have a clue. He was like the worst drummer you'd ever seen in your life. Many people think Keith Moon was never tutored on the drums, but he actually took lessons from a frightening man named Carlo Little of the Savages, a local rock group. Moon paid Little 10 shillings per lesson. Moon played the drums in his first rock band, The Escorts, in 1962. Then, a short time later, he joined The Beachcombers, one of the best cover bands in the London area. While working, Moon liked wearing a gold lame suit, the likes of which few people had the balls to put on. From a young age, Keith Moon often stole tape recorders, drums, amplifiers and furniture, whatever he thought he or his friends needed to be musicians. In order to cope with staying up late for gigs and then working at another job early in the morning, Moon, like many other musicians, began popping uppers such as Purple Hearts or French Blues. Ironically, years later, doctors began prescribing amphetamines such as Dexedrine to treat ADHD. No wonder Keith liked them so much. Keith Moon auditioned for The Who, which accepted him reluctantly, though accounts vary as to how the event happened. At any rate, The Who were going to try Keith out to determine his long-term viability. Many years later, Moon said he had spent the last 15 years trying out for The Who. Hey, if you're enjoying this video, make sure you give it a like and subscribe to remember this if you haven't already. Click the bell icon to stay updated on all of our latest content. As the story goes, during one of Moon's first gigs with The Who, Pete Townsend, while experimenting with a Swiss Echo effects box, blew out the PA system and then cried, drum solo. So Moon pounded away for the next 15 minutes while the others repaired the damage. After the performance, Moon stripped off his t-shirt and wrung the sweat from it, soon filling two wine glasses. 
Adopting the new mod fashion, The Who became a so-called mod band and played in mod nightclubs. The Who were also known as an R&B band, similar in playing style to the Rolling Stones and the Animals. During a performance at the Railway Hotel, Pete Townsend accidentally poked his Rickenbacker guitar through the low ceiling, breaking the neck, and the crowd roared, thinking it was part of the act. Then at the end of another show at the hotel, Keith Moon kicked over his entire drum kit. From then on, Townsend and Moon would trash their gear at the end of each performance, beginning a long, enduring, and often imitated ritual. Moon's lifestyle began to undermine his health and reliability. During the 1973 Quadrophenia tour at the Cow Palace in Daly City, California, Moon ingested a mixture of tranquilizers and brandy. During the concert, Moon passed out on his drum kit during Won't Get Fooled Again. The band stopped playing and a group of roadies carried Moon off stage. They gave him a shower and an injection of cortisone, sending him back on stage after a 30-minute delay. Moon passed out again during Magic Bus and was again removed from the stage. The band continued without him for several songs before Townsend asked, Can anyone play the drums? I mean somebody good. A drummer in the audience, Scott Halpin, came up and played the rest of the show. During the opening date of the band's 1976 US tour at the Boston Garden, Moon passed out over his drum kit after two numbers and the show was rescheduled. The next evening, Moon systematically destroyed everything in his hotel room, cut himself doing so and passed out. He was discovered by manager Bill Kerbishley, who took him to a hospital. Doctors told Kerbishley that if he had not intervened, Moon would have bled to death. It was suggested at this point that Daltrey and Entwistle seriously consider firing Moon, but they decided that doing so would make his life worse. Because The Who's early stage act relied on smashing instruments and owing to Moon's enthusiasm for damaging hotels, the group were in debt for much of the 1960s. Entwistle estimated they lost about £150,000. Even when the group became relatively financially stable after Tommy, Moon continued to rack up debts. He bought a number of cars and gadgets and flirted with bankruptcy. Moon's recklessness with money reduced his profit from the group's 1975 UK tour to just £47.35. The real Keith Moon was a son, a brother, a father and an insecure man. The public Keith Moon was the Who's manic drummer and hell-raising daredevil comedian, a man who only ever lived in the moment. And it was this version of Keith Moon that led to his untimely death on September 7th, 1978. A month earlier, the Who released Who Are You, their first new album in three years. But Keith's drinking and drug-taking had impacted on his performance and his appearance. Moon's playing was becoming erratic and unreliable. Keith's condition meant The Who were in no state to tour, which left him anxious and depressed. Moon had been taking heminephrine for some time. It was a powerful sedative prescribed to him by Harley Street physician Dr. Jeffrey Diamond. Heminephrine quelled the craving for alcohol, but sometimes left users in a docile and forgetful state. But it worked. In the days leading up to his death, Moon cut back on the booze. On September the 6th, Paul McCartney threw a party at the Covent Garden Diner Peppermint Park to celebrate what would have been Buddy Holly's 42nd birthday. McCartney had acquired the rights to Holly's song publishing and a biopic The Buddy Holly Story was premiering later that night. Moon initially told his girlfriend Annette Walter-Lax he didn't want to go to the party. When she told him she wanted to go anyway, he changed his mind and called his dealer who delivered some cocaine. The couple arrived at Peppermint Park, where Annette had since insisted Moon didn't drink, or if he did, limited himself to just two drinks. While he was still using cocaine, the fact that he didn't go wild on the free champagne was considered progress. After the party, Moon and Annette attended the midnight premiere of the Buddy Holly story at the Odeon, Leicester Square. Inside the cinema, Keith seemed agitated and insisted they leave an hour into the movie. He was restless, said Annette. He said, 
I don't want to sit through this. Let's go. Back at their flat in Mayfair, Moon told Annette he was hungry. She cooked his favourite lamb cutlets, after which they went to bed to watch a video of the camp horror film The Abominable Dr. Fibes. Moon had been exceeding his prescribed dose of hemonephrine the same way he abused every other drug, but Annette hadn't realised quite how many pills he was taking. In Annette's account, Moon woke up at 7.30am and told her he wanted food. He was in a bad mood and they argued, but Annette cooked him some more lamb. After clearing the plate, Moon took more hemonephrine and fell asleep again, but his snoring meant Annette retreated to the sofa where she slept until 3.40pm. After waking up, she ventured back into the bedroom where she found Moon lying on his stomach with his left arm hanging over the side of the bed. I couldn't hear him breathing. Right there and then I knew something was wrong. I went into a panic, she said. Annette rang Dr. Diamond, who called an ambulance, but it was too late. Moon had been dead for some time, but was officially pronounced dead at 5.50pm at Middlesex Hospital. The official cause of death was listed on the certificate as hemonephrine overdose. Self-administered, but no evidence of intention. Open verdict. It was later revealed that Moon had 26 undissolved hemonephrine tablets still in his stomach when he died. For many close to Keith, his death came as more of a shock because they knew he'd cut back on the excessive behaviour. He was, they insist, trying to get better. What nobody knew was the damaging effects of the prescription drugs he was taking and in such quantities. At Moon's funeral, Daltrey told the mourners he still half expected Keith to leap from the coffin, claiming it was all a joke. Sadly, it wasn't. Rock's greatest drummer was just 32 years old when he died. Keith Moon had played the drums in a similar way to how he lived his life, frenetic to the point where chaos could erupt around him at any given moment. When it comes to the excess and antics of rock and roll, Keith Moon didn't just partake, he wrote the playbook. Sadly, the lifestyle took its toll on Moon, who packed more into his 32 years than most people could manage in a couple of lifetimes cruelly losing his life to an overdose of prescription pills designed to help alleviate the alcohol withdrawal he was experiencing while attempting to get sober. What's your favourite Keith Moon moment? Or do you have a particular album or song by The Who that you go back to on a regular basis? Let us know in the comments below and don't forget to subscribe to Remember This.